right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the very first inaugural maiden voyage of the illiterate uh, standard of proof webinar series. Um, really excited to have you here at the historic Muppet Theater. Uh, please pardon our renovations. I've got a couple of ferns on order to, to spice up the stage here. But in the meantime, I've got a very special surprise for you. I want you all to look under your chairs because we have fabulous prizes for all of you. Mine's a dog. Um, seriously though, I'm really excited um, uh, about this webinar series. Um, the title um, uh, comes from two um, important and related themes. The first is that um, educators at colleges and universities everywhere both should and can um, look at evidence um, to improve their practices for supporting student success. That we can know what works um, and we can get better at that. Uh, and the second um, and related point is that very often in the process of doing that, um, we, we uh, need to work with tools that are built by someone else. Um, we need that, the help of our vendors. And um, so as you go through your procurement process to pick out tools to meet your goals, and you should always be picking out tools to meet your goals um, to support your students, um, you should be uh, mindful and aware of the kinds of support that you're looking for um, and the kinds of questions uh, that a vendor ought to be able to answer for you. And so we, we're, we're going to model that here in this series. Um, I couldn't have asked for a better starting topic and starting panel to illustrate the goals of what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, I'm uh, really excited about the conversation we're going to have today. Um, our panelists include Dr. Tim Rennick, uh, Senior Vice President for Student Success at Georgia State University. Uh, Dr. Lindsay Page, Associate Professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Education and Drew Maliazzi, co-founder of uh, and CEO of Admit Hub. Um, these uh, all-star group, uh, this is a canonical example of the kind of problem solving that we all can and should be engaged in. Uh, so again, delighted to have you all here today. Um, let's start out by thinking about the general proposition, uh, standard of proof uh, and um, what that means uh, uh, Tim, I'm going to ask just before we dive into the specifics of Summer Melt, you know, I had the great fortune, ladies and gentlemen, of, of hearing Tim speak uh, last week, and I I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase the high level message. Uh, but it was in, in my mind um, that we um, we need to stop making excuses about not having uh, college ready students and, and start focusing on our attention on making sure we have student ready colleges. Um, and so Tim, uh, I wonder if you could just take a minute to give us a couple of fast facts about Georgia State's uh, context and some of the big picture accomplishments that you've been able uh, to, to, to demonstrate in terms of uh, student success to show that you can move the needle on this with uh, the students that arrive at your door. Sure, Michael. Yeah, uh, Georgia State's at the leading edge of demographic trends really going on across the United States, but especially in the Southeast. You know, when I arrived here as a junior faculty member back in the late 1980s, it was a majority white campus. 70% of the students are, were white. Now we're 74% non-white. About 60% of our students are, are Pell eligible, so low income students. And, you know, usually those demographic shifts would suggest a downturn in success rates, right? These are the populations that struggle the most nationally to complete college. And what we've been able to do at Georgia State and data and evidence has been a critical part of the puzzle is uh, put conventional wisdom on its ear. So over the last decade, we've improved graduation rates by 23 percentage points. We've eliminated equity gaps. We've had five years in a row now where our African-American, our Hispanic, and our low-income students are all graduating at least at the rate of the student body overall, in some cases a little higher. And we're now graduating more African-Americans than any other college or university in the United States. 
And if I were to, you know, attribute the, 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 the uh, turnaround to any one factor, it would start with the data and start with the evidence. Fantastic. Okay, so Tim, so, so we've got a clear sense of your mission. Um, how did you get on the topic of summer melt? Well, I've been doing this job at Georgia State, he heading up all the student success programs for over a decade. When I first in started in this position back in the, you know, around 2009, 10, about 9 to 10% of our confirmed freshman class never showed up. So we had a group of students who had did e done everything high school, they applied to college, they got into Georgia State, they confirmed they were coming to Georgia State, in many cases coming to orientation, signing up for classes. It's just when fall classes began, they didn't, they didn't show up. And every year for much of the past decade, certainly until 2016, that number was growing. So it moved from about 10% of the freshman class to over 18% of the freshman class that never showed up. And so we realized that we needed to do something about this. Uh, the, the, this group uh, skewed predominantly uh, low income, predominantly first generation. Most of these students were uh, non-white, uh, uh, underrepresented minorities. And so what we were seeing is the beginning of achievement gaps or equity gaps before the students ever set foot on campus. We were already losing uh, a, a subset of our low income first generation students. Great, um, and I understand there was a little book that uh, you might've stumbled across that helped you out. <laughs> Absolutely so, yeah. So uh, amidst this, this growing crisis where, as I say, we were reaching 18, 19% of our freshman class who just never showed up, uh, I came across a wonderful book uh, by uh, Lindsay Page and Ben Castleman who, who uh, cover the summer melt problem in a very personal fashion, show the human side of what that means, what, what are some of the origins of it. And so uh, I assigned the book to my leadership team, a group of you know, 12, 14 people who direct our Office of Admissions, financial aid, the registrar, and so forth, people who report up to me. And, and we read it uh, and had a uh, detailed discussion of what we might be able to do uh, mm -hmm. to try to deal with summer melt in a more effective fashion. And, and Drew, I, I understand that you had a similar encounter with literature. <laughs> I did indeed. Um, I, I actually first read the research paper that Lindsay and Ben um, published and then subsequently read the book. Uh, and frankly, it was the inspiration for us to start the company we have today. Uh, what Admit Hub does is we build a communications platform that combines the power of behavioral science uh, and uses artificial intelligence to scale it. And frankly, I thought both from reading the book and from personal experience as a one-to-one -one tutor for several years, knowing that text message was the best way to get in touch with people, but being very frustrated having to do it manually, that we could build some technology, um, leveraging the cutting edge stuff in AI uh, to do it at an extraordinary scale. Um, so frankly, Lindsay, we all wouldn't be here uh, without you. Oh, go on. <laughs> I think I think I'll give you my dean's email address when we're done with this. Perfect. <laughs> so I I am reading the book myself right now. I highly recommend it. I'm holding it up as a visual aid because the title might be a little hard to remember. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's fantastic. Um, don't look for it in the Kindle store. This is analog, and it is worth every ounce in your luggage. I promise you that. Um, so, Lindsay, um, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about what summer melt really is? Uh, Tim talked about uh, these mysterious uh, disappearing students. Um, uh, help us solve that mystery. Yeah, so um, uh, thank you so much for um, teeing up uh, my comments so well. So, um, traditionally, uh, the term summer melt has been used by um, admissions officers, enrollment uh, counselors to um, describe a student who uh, reported intentions to enroll, didn't enroll at that particular institution. Uh, but the assumption was always that, well, if the student didn't come to us, then maybe he or she just got off of a wait list and went somewhere else. Um, so that was really what the term originally implied or how it was originally used. And we sort of reappropriated that term um, instead to think about students, um, just as Tim described, that um, plan to enroll in a particular institution 
And when we, we looked at those students in, uh, again, thinking about the data in National Student Clearinghouse data that let us understand whether students who were college intending were enrolling anywhere, what we found was that there was a large segment of students who weren't making that transition successfully to the institution that they had intended, and in fact, not making that transition to any institution at all. Um, and so Summer Melt, in, in our work, we really describe uh, the students that Tim is describing, those who plan at the time of high school graduation to make that transition to college, uh, but for a variety of reasons, don't successfully make the transition. Well, Michael, you're on mute. Might help if I unmute myself. <laughs> uh, can you talk a little bit more, Lindsay, about the particular barriers? Why, why it is that that, that students um, yeah seem to never get where they're going? Absolutely. Because so, so this um, oh, great graphic. Um, so the the graphic that we've used to really think about this um, is that. Um, uh, after students are admitted to college, there's really a maze of steps that they need to navigate in order to get all the way through to enrollment. Um, what's also interesting about this period of summer is that it's typically a period of time when students and their families don't have a lot of access to guidance and support. So students have left their high schools. High schools are usually sort of buttoned up for the summer and uh, they haven't yet joined their college community. So it's not obvious to them that they could go to their, their college offices, even though they could, they could go to their college offices to ask for guidance and support. What's interesting about this period of time is because there are so many different things that students need to be navigating, um, and it's hard for them to necessarily know where to look when, students can be uh, uh, unaware that there are certain tasks that they should be taking care of during the summer time. So I believe there's a little animation in this slide. If you just want to click forward one go. Um, if we think about the types of tasks that students need to navigate over this period of time, um, one thing is for sure is it's, it's kind of the period of time where the rubber hits the road with regard to paying for college. So students may still be navigating completion of their FAFSA. They may be asked to verify information they've reported on their FAFSA. They may be trying to understand their financial aid award letter or um, dealing with the fact that they have unmet financial needs. Um, so so there, are, there are lots of tasks related to um, financing college. Uh, that can be challenging for families. If you click forward one, there are, there are a lot of other types of tasks that students need to be navigating, like submitting a housing application. That often has a financial component with paying a housing deposit, attending orientation and figuring out how to get to campus for that orientation, taking pl placement tests, and so forth. And the other thing that we should keep in mind, again, if you click forward one, um, one more, uh, is, is that um, these are students uh, were, were not entirely, but uh, at least in the work that Ben Kesselman and I have done so far, we've been thinking about uh, traditionally aged college going populations. So students who are 17, 18, 19 years old, um, they may be a little on the impulsive side. They're not great future planners. They may have a lot of um, competing priorities that they're focusing on. And so um, as Drew mentioned, um, really taking a behavioral um, uh, tact towards tackling this problem, um, we want to think about uh, how to reach out to this population in a timely way and really focusing their attention um, where it needs to be focused most. Just to pull out one of these examples, um, Tim, last week you, you said that the FAFSA form is basically a, a tax document, um, more or less. It's like filling out your 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 tax return and i i know that as a as a young college student i didn't fill out my fafsa form my father filled it out for me and as i look at the list of these um uh, items um i don't think there was a single one that i navigated without parental help and i had been at least theoretically taught to be as uh you know taught the skills um, the college going skills that I was supposed to be taught as a middle class college prep tracked kid. So, so a lot of this was invisible to me and is likely invisible to the people um, who manage the process. Um, so Tim, why don't we talk a little bit about making the invisible visible um, and addressing it. Um, what, what tools after uh, uh, speaking with Lindsay and, and having your staff become aware of this, uh, 
um, challenge. Um, what tools did you decide that you need and how did you go about um, figuring out how to tackle this problem? Yeah, good, good, good questions. I mean, I, the first thing to say to underline what Lindsay was just talking about is we did an analysis of exactly what was happening to our students. We had never really paid attention in detail to what specific steps from a bureaucratic perspective were tripping up our students. And, you know, in many ways, it was a nightmare for a, a student body that is mostly low income, mostly first generation. You have, you know, uh, students being raised by their grandmother, getting requests in the middle of July and August from the federal government for verification that the grandmother is the legal guardian and that the parents, the biological parents are not providing uh, financial support for that individual. And, you know, no 17, 18 year old is probably going to respond to that effectively. But these particular 17, 18 year olds in, from low income backgrounds, th these families are not going to lawyers and filling out official paperwork to move guardianship to grandma. Uh, you know, mom and dad are gone, grandma's taken over. The student gets this request from the federal government saying we want written verification and pretty much tucks it in, in, in his pocket and says, I guess I'm not going to college because I don't have written verification. My grandma doesn't either. So what we needed to do is begin to think about ways to help the students at those pain points, those times during the summer where they're facing something very specific without the tools and the context in, able to, uh, in order to be able to navigate it. You know, we had for years been doing what every university does. We send students emails, right? We send them emails by the dozen. We can track how many of those emails get opened. And, you know, sadly, even for our incoming freshmen, only about 20% even get looked at. And even so, the emails that we send and we're not nuanced enough to deal with the problems that the students have. We might be sending them an email reminder to turn in your FAFSA because the deadline's coming up, but the student's problem is they've just gotten a notice saying that they need to be able to show that their grandmother is their legal guardian. So we weren't being responsive enough to the individual issues that, that students were facing. And at the time, uh, this is the summer of 2016, where we were looking for better solutions, there, there was not any um, a magic uh, uh, system out there that we thought filled the, filled the bill. Um, there were what are called nudging platforms. There were ways we could text students in a unidirectional sort of way. So we could send them a text to let them know a deadline was coming up or they needed to do something. But if they had a problem, if they wanted a response, say, well, I know the deadline is next week, but here's the problem. I need to get my father to sign the form and I haven't seen my father for the last 18 months. There was no easy way for them to voice those kind of opinions. We also had people waiting on phones, you know, to answer these questions, but a lot of the students just never called. And so we had this growing number of students who were facing challenges that in effect were surmountable. We could get them the help they need to overcome these obstacles, but we were never getting in contact with them. They were, we were never uh, able to address their problem in a timely fashion. And I would, I, I just want to sort of piggyback something um, that Tim just shared. I, I, I have seen that over and over in, in research that I have done with, with Georgia State in, in other settings as well. For any institution, it is simply not sufficient to set up a passive system of advising, to say, the advising office is here and here are ours. And if you figure out what your question is, you come on in and we're going to help you with that. Um, if we, what we, when we did that in the context of our experiments, we basically found that nobody came through the door. Nobody called. Um, whereas if you, if you prompt students through the summer to say, hey, here's the thing that you should be thinking about. Are you thinking about that? How's it going? What questions do you have? That's the kind of strategy that is going to get students through the door, that is going to surface the challenges that are actually uh, sort of bubbling underneath the surface. I, th I think that's a great point. And I'll add that as we talk as a nation about equity and achievement gaps, part of the problem is right here. Because the mm -hmm. students from middle and upper income backgrounds and maybe from majority demographic groups feel more empowered to say, I demand an explanation. Students from low income first generation back, uh, backgrounds are often very reluctant to push the system. So not only are we doing a poor job as universities at, uh, of proactively getting them this information, but they're not the most likely students to raise their hand and say, I need help. That's right. So Tim, in facing this, um, complex challenge, this sort of multi-headed challenge, uh, you made two decisions. Uh, you decided to contract with a vendor and you decided to engage in a study 
about the impact of your intervention. Can you talk to me a little bit about those two decisions and how they related to each other? Yeah, like a lot of universities, when we go about looking for a technology partner, we do a search. You know, we look at what's out there, the features that the different vendors offer and so forth. And at the time, this is now talking about early 2016, most of the tech companies that were offering help with communicating with incoming student populations had what I was describing as a nudging system, a, a unidirectional texting platform that would allow the university to nudge the students but not provide the students with any ability to respond uh, back again. So we had a very targeted search. What we were looking for in a technology partner was a company that could help us overcome that limit and allow the students to get back to us with any questions or follow-ups or problems they had. And so that was a critical component of what we needed to do. Now, why we decided to go with a random control trial and, 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 and basically work with Drew and Lindsay on doing a, uh, a, a controlled study is really quite practical. You know, any of these changes at a university are hard to enact. Uh, institutions tend to be very set in their ways. There are a lot of very smart people who think that they know best how to deal with a myriad of issues, faculty and staff who are often, you know, highly degreed. And so what we've done at Georgia State consistently is try to find from the very beginning of new initiatives, the data to track to support and ultimately to confirm uh, uh, the usefulness of whatever intervention we have in place. There, there are not many languages that unite all the faculty at a big comprehensive university like Georgia State. I mean, we have faculty in neuroscience and we have faculty in uh, studio art. But one thing all the faculty are trained to do is respect the evidence. They've all gone through graduate programs and they have, you know, th this kind of training as their background. So we find it very helpful to the first time we're trying to launch something, often before we're able to fully scale it, use that moment in order to create a controlled trial where we have a treatment group and a control group, a students who are getting the new, new initiative and those who uh, perhaps are not yet, and being able to use that moment in order to uh, track comparative data. Um, uh, Drew and Lindsay, I wanna to talk to each of you about that a little bit in turn. Um, Drew, uh, I speak to a lot of small companies uh, preaching the gospel of getting involved in the kind of uh, uh, research work that, that Tim was just describing. And very often I hear, well, we'd love to, but it's, it's um, you know, we're small. We, we're just trying to uh, pay our salaries right now. And uh, you know, this is something we'll have to get to uh, later. But I understand that you were, looking for an opportunity like this really early on, really early on. Um, <laughs> why? Uh, well, first, thank you for asking. First, probably out of necessity. I think there are two reasons personally why I like to follow the data. One is that I'm a mediocre salesperson. <laughs> so uh, I, I couldn't frankly, in good faith, tell somebody it's going to work if I didn't believe it myself, and I have a pretty high threshold for believing it. I think even our pitch to, to Tim and Scott Burke over at Georgia State was, it might work, <laughs> we hope. Um, and luckily, they were believers, uh, and we had Lindsay on the conference call as well. Um, but also, the second one is, I didn't want to waste my time doing something that was ineffective, frankly. I think the worst outcome of all would have been something that I wasted years of my life pursuing, which frankly did no good, maybe did some harm, but or no harm at all, but frankly was a net neutral. Um, I don't think that would be a very good way to spend a life. Um, I will also say that if RCT, with your very first partner, is a great recipe for sleepless nights and gray hair. <laughs> I have got a little like patch, I don't know if you can see it on my chin, <laughs> thanks to that RCT, um, because I saw all the warts and hiccups. And um, I think even Lindsay, if memory serves, the hypothesis was that after we launched, uh, I think we launched about eight weeks later than we expected, you kindly told me that you didn't think it was going to work. <laughs> Maybe that was just <laughs> for my expectations. <laughs> um, but lo and behold, it did, which uh, is why we're all here, I suppose. But frankly, 
I wouldn't have done it any other way if I had it to do over again, even without knowing the outcome, I would do the same thing. And frankly, also, it's good to note we've com continued the commitment. It would be easy to say one RCT and done, um, but we've done eight more, which uh, have consistently shown impact in similar settings on similar problems, or even very diverse settings and even very diverse problems. So um, it's, it's frankly a core part of the DNA of who I am and I think what the company stands for. I, I think the other thing that I would just add is, um, you know, having, having the research component was really important for me um, in getting involved. And I think um, it was brave, both of Georgia State, it was brave of AdmitHub to, to do that. But I think that there is such an opportunity to um, sort of contribute to the broader understanding of how should universities be changing their practice in order to be more uh, student focused. Folks, I, I want to emphasize what you just heard. I mean, randomized controlled trial is one way to do research. Um, it's, uh, there are multiple ways to do research. It happens to be particularly rigorous um, and uh, in some ways painful. Um, no, no, uh, no, no. Wrote. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, chance. it doesn't have to be, I'm, you have to take that back. It does not have to be painful. It also does not have to be expensive. There uh, are graduate students all over this country who are hungry for meaningful research to do. And so I think that there's also an opportunity to leverage that underutilized resource in, in order to test the things that we're, that we're trying. Thank you, Lindsay. I do take it back, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to amplify on that later. Okay. Uh, because it's a really important point. Uh, what I was getting to here is that here's a, a very small, um, very new company um, yes. when it starts out that does a randomized controlled trials. And Drew, did I hear the count correctly? Did you say nine randomized controlled yeah. trials? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not all of them are complete yet, but uh, we've got nine either in flight or completed. So, so folks, look, you know, these companies on the one hand, they need your help because they can't do the research in absent of a collaborating university, right? So some of this is on all of you in the audience. But at the same time, the, it, you know, uh, you should not accept from a, from a vendor that they just can't do the research because it can be done, it should be done, we have a collective responsibility to do it. Um, so Lindsay, I, I do want to, I want to pivot to you because very often I know that, uh, f folks in your position are out doing good work, writing books once again on Amazon. Just in, just, just in time for the holidays. Uh, just in time. Exactly. <laughs> I want, you know, it's a great stocking stuffer. Uh, um, but, um, very often the incentive um, on the one hand in the research community is to move on to the next study. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you don't get the kind of institutional engagement that you got from Georgia State saying, okay, how do we put this into action and actually help students? So could you talk a little bit about um, that experience uh, working with Georgia State and in MidHub and also any, any advice that you have for our audience about um, thinking about engaging, you know, bridging the gap between good research and putting that research into practice in a way that really helps students. Yeah. So um, in terms of uh, sort of um, lessons, lessons for practice in engaging with researchers, I think one of the, one of the key lessons is researchers are your friends and um, you should have your research partners at the table from the get-go, that um, part of the plan for implementation should at the same time be the plan for, uh, for research, because the research and the implementation plan should go hand in hand. It is much harder for uh, a researcher to be brought in after the fact, and you know, for the, um, for the uh, technology partner, for the institution doing the implementing, for them to have done something and then come to the researcher and say, tell us if it worked or not. 
um, because that's going to lead to uh, sort of reconstruction of the of the truth, reconstruction of what happened, and a, a much less credible research design. Um, I, I will say that um, bringing a strong research design to the table, uh, I guess, you know, in this case, um, we, we did find positive effects, and I imagine that that also um, was a key part to subsequent fundraising on the work, um, so that um, it would be possible to go from this study on summer melt to then asking questions about, okay, how can this tool be leveraged to support students in other uh, time points in their educational journey? Yeah, and, and maybe I should speak to that because uh, any of the, the listeners who are from university perspective, I think that we have an obligation to try to uh, support this kind of research. And it's, it's self-interested as well, as Lindsay is suggesting, that, you know, you think about this, we were launching something that was very, very new, you know, trying to deal with summer melt via an AI-enhanced uh, uh, chatbot. We didn't know, as Drew pointed out, whether this would work or not, although we thought, strongly thought it had a good chance of working. But because of Lindsay's research, you know, six months after we, we uh, concluded that first summer, you know, she was publishing uh, and sharing uh, RCT quality data, uh, I guess initially Journal of Social Science Research, and then later it was re re republished or some of the work was re revisited in the Harvard Business Review. There couldn't be anything more valuable to me uh, on campus and trying to convince my stakeholders to support this, including the president, the chief financial officer, and so forth, than saying, look, we tried something, and here's the confirmed data for the impact it has. And oh, by the way, it's not only working from a student success perspective, it's bringing additional revenues into the university because each of those students who was walking away in the past is now enrolled paying tuition and fees. You know, this is really critical. And as, as Lindsay was hinting at, this allowed us uh, a, a few months later to go to some national foundations, Dell Foundation, ECMC, to get additional support for the next iteration of the work we were doing with chatbots and uh, uh, ultimately work with uh, partners in the University Innovation Alliance uh, to uh, uh, spread this work to other large public universities. So it, it, it's not like we were doing this by some, you know, in some sacrifice. This was really something that served our interests very strongly and made it possible uh, for us to greatly expand the program. I'm tempted to take a little uh, diversion into the, um, the value of, uh, of such experiments that produce quote unquote failures, uh, because uh, we do learn a lot, um, even when, uh, particularly sometimes when what we think will work turns out that it doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. But you struck gold on the first time, so <laughs> and we only have 30 minutes left and we need to explain everything there is to understand about artificial intelligence, so I think we're going to move on. Uh, <laughs> um, so Drew, I, um, let, let's turn to that topic. Uh, I have um, almost, nine, probably nine times out of ten when I write about AI, uh, an illiterate it's in a post that is heaped with scorn and snark. Um, and it's not because I think Appropriately that- Appropriately so. <laughs> it's, it, it's not because I think that, uh, that these data science techniques have no value in education. To the contrary, I've also written a long posts trying to explain really obscure and maybe to some people boring topics about how these are useful, but um, but it's really because some, sometimes those two letters, AI, or their just ever so slightly pompous um, uh, cousins, machine learning, uh, can be used as a kind of razzle-dazzle to try to convince uh, educators at institutions that really this is way too complicated for them to understand and they should just take our word that it works. Uh, mm -hmm. After all, they only have, you know, some of them only have PhDs. Uh, so, um, could you tell us, so we, we have the situation, we have a chat bot, I think most people understand what it looks like, there's a conversational interface, you know, they can, you can think of it without AI as a kind of automated FAQ, and um, yeah. maybe if it's a sophisticated automated FAQ, it'll have a little bit of branching in it. Um, but, uh, but for a long time, chat bots were kind of stuck there. Um, so could you help us understand 
what is AI and, and, and how does it, how does that help with this problem? Sure, sure thing, Michael. Um, and I'll make it quick. It'll be like a bee sting. No one will be hurt too badly <laughs> <laughs> from this little diatribe. And we um, have a smiley before, face band aid afterward. <laughs> yes. Before I begin, I think the most important thing to note is that AI is an incredibly powerful technology, and specifically machine learning as a subset, um, that really is not a point solution. Frankly, for it to be used most effectively, it needs to be woven into the fabric of the core strategy of an institution. And I honestly think, not to gloss over this fact, the most important aspect of our partnership was that, frankly, Tim, you invited us in. And you invited us in to show us all that was working and not working and what needed to be done to help ameliorate the problem. That was, the, frankly, the most important aspect of what we ended up doing together. Um, in any event, I've got four quick slides that will uh, talk to uh, everyone about this, what exactly AI is. So frankly, this is an animated uh, image of a Turing machine, also known as the digital computer. And it was designed to solve any problem or perform any task for which a, a program could be written. Uh, it was actually invented by Alan, Alan Turing, played here by Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, to crack the German code during World War II. And it also initiated essentially the age of artificial intelligence. This was in the 1940s. In essence, you could say all computers are AI uh, in one form or another, but frankly, it's breakthroughs in machine learning that you talked about, Michael, uh, specifically a thing called deep learning with convolutional neural networks that have brought huge advances to the field lately. Uh, but before we get into the, the geekery of the technology, uh, let's talk for a quick second about one aspect of human intelligence. Frankly, that's prediction. Prediction is the primary function of the neocortex, uh, which makes uh, the part of our brain, uh, the frontal lobe of our brain, uniquely human. Um, and actually, this uh, framework is taken from a book titled Prediction Machines, to plug yet another one for your stockings this uh, holiday season, uh, which is a very accessible read. But essentially, prediction is using information that you do have to generate information that you don't have. Um, and frankly, while prediction is essential for decision making, it is not a decision. Uh, and a great uh, illustration of this uh, is appropriate today. Um, it, given a 70% chance of rain this afternoon by the weather person, uh, that's a prediction. The decision is whether or not I'm going to bring an umbrella to work and risk losing it on the subway. Um, and so frankly, AI is already making predictions more accurately and abundantly than ever before. You notice the weather person is not wrong any longer. Uh, and re recommendations and predictions all over the internet are becoming more accurate and personalized. But frankly, uh, the decisions we make with that information are the key to the success with this technology. Meaning frankly, AI again has to be core to the most strategic decisions you're you're making to get the greatest value out of it. So I'll talk really briefly now about the specific flavor of AI that we use, which is called natural language processing. And the prediction we make is trying to predict the meaning of language uh, with a neural network and trying to represent it as a number. In essence, we're turning words into numbers. And here's a brief representation about how one word might have high rankings like king on masculinity and royalty, but low on femininity, and queen might have similarly high rankings on royalty, but low on masculinity, yet high on femininity. And the idea here is that you're able to do astoundingly uh, complex mathematical computation with language, um, essentially to help remind you of all your um, under, uh, undergraduate or AP physics courses, what we are doing when language meets mathematics is we are turning words into numbers and manipulating that language uh, with mathematics to understand what it means. Watsky, can you do the next slide? So in this next slide, what we have is representing these numbers that I had in the previous slide uh, graphically. You can say something like king minus man plus woman, and you'll get the output for queen. Um, we can also understand synonyms for things. 
someone might ask, who is the queen? And we would know that question. And then without specifically training the system, you could say, um, who's the female monarch? And we can also understand it. And frankly, this was super helpful in the issues that we face, um, obviously with students enrolling, where they asked tons and tons of questions, but no two students asked the same question the same way. In fact, oftentimes they would say things that were completely foreign. No one ever, ever asked, what is the process by which I submit my financial aid documentation? They would say things like, I have no money. <laughs> and we had to be smart enough to be able to give them the right answer to that particular question or statement um, without having to explicitly train the system every time, otherwise we would have been terribly inaccurate. So that's my quick bee sting uh, on how this particular brand of AI works and AI in general. And the mantra I always say is frankly, again, you need to make it part of your core strategy and you should hail it because I hail from Massachusetts, take the mentality, ask not what AI can do for you, uh, but what you and AI can do together. Um, that is hope, the guiding principle I like to suggest uh, folks take with this technology, whether it's working with us or anyone else. Okay. So a couple of points on questions and answers. First of all, Q&A is open, uh, more gen generally speaking. Kelvin, I see you. I promise I will get to your question before the end of the, uh, of the webinar. And so if you all have questions, I shouldn't be the only one who's allowed to ask. Um, uh, you should all feel free to ask your vendors when they start throwing around terms like AI, um, a, a question like I just asked. And if you don't get an answer that is as clear and as, um, uh, let's just say, non-hyped uh, as the <laughs> one we got from Drew, tell them to go away. Uh, Actually, Michael, can I also chime in with one caveat on the title of this webinar? Yes, please. Because I think it's titled... Uh, feel free to be um, brutal because I didn't make it. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it was something like AI, uh, the success of AI or whatever on student, the impact of AI on student success. And frankly, I think we played a, a part, but it, it was a pretty small part. Frankly, all the impact was made by the folks at Georgia State the resources that they had available to them and the the steps that they had taken to break down barriers. The place we did, the role we played was getting people to those resources into the thresholds of those meetings. But frankly, without the extraordinary staff and resources available, our technology would have been useless. Uh, we just helped unlock the potential, I think, of the, the work you're already doing, Tim. I appreciate that, Drew, but you may be be uh, a little overly modest there because uh, listeners should know that in the first uh, five or so months we had the chatbot open at Georgia State, the system handled about 185,000 interactions with our students. And, you know, you can imagine uh, incoming freshman class, as Drew was just saying, these freshmen are going to ask the same questions over and over again. They want money. They want to figure out, you know, the loans and how they get grants and so forth. They want to figure out how to register, how to find housing on campus and so forth. They will ask these questions hundreds of times over and in thousands of different ways. And what this system was so effective in doing is cutting through the clutter and getting the student these answers in a really efficient uh, fashion. The average response time to a question posed via the chatbot that first summer was about six seconds. So instead of individual staff in our housing office or our financial aid office or our admissions office answering these questions dozens and dozens of times over, in many cases, uh, these answers you know, came automatically and quickly, and that freed up the time of the staff to answer the tougher questions, the questions that really do take a one-on-one -on -one, uh, you know, person to really think through uh, with, with the students. So uh, yeah, we needed to have the resources and the staffing in place or none of this would have mattered, but uh, the, 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 the AI and the chatbot uh, made the whole system work so much more effectively than we had ever been able to handle it in the past. One other, one other thing that I would add to that that I think is really um, special about the implementation at Georgia State, both from a, a program implementation standpoint, but also from a research standpoint, is the data that uh, it was possible to bring to bear. And so one thing that was very important about the way the outreach was done 
Even though there were thousands of students asking the same question, not everybody who was eligible to receive every, every piece of outreach, uh, it, it wasn't relevant for everybody. So for, if, as a very concrete example, if a student had submitted their paperwork for housing already, they didn't get any outreach related to housing paperwork because that outreach was not relevant. And so I think that that kind of data integration is hugely important because otherwise we're just going to cloud these kinds of communication channels that at least for now are successful. Um, it's just going to muck those up with all sorts of communication that isn't relevant for students and they're going to start regarding any kind of outreach as spam. So integrating the data and using the administrative data to be really targeted in outreach uh, is, is uh, uh, one other piece that I think was really critical to the success. Okay, so um, as with many of these types of solutions, um, this one sounds not only fantastic, but kind of obvious in retrospect. Um, so, uh, Lindsay, I'm going to give you an opportunity to um, make me eat a little more humble pie, <laughs> uh, explaining in, pro in prospect, um, how did you go about figuring out um, whether the intervention was working. And, and I, I want to emphasize, folks, that an experimental design is a contribution in and of itself. Learning how to properly frame a question so that you can get an answer and know if you're helping, what's helping, and how helping, and how it's helping, those are really important things. So, so with that, Lindsay, tell us, um, Tell us a little bit about how the magic worked. Sure, sure. Um, so it's not magic. Um, um, in, so, so prior to this particular um, project, I had, I had done with colleagues a number of summer milk focused experiments. And the uh, key uh, structure of, of a randomized trial would be to, at the beginning of the study, at the beginning of the implementation, before you're implementing with students, identify all of those students who are eligible to receive, in this case, the summer milk outreach. Um, and then once you have that eligible population or that eligible sample of students, um, you split them into two groups, a group who are actually gonna get the outreach and a group that doesn't get the outreach. And then the key is to follow both of those groups over time. Uh, in the implementation at Georgia State University with the chatbot, um, again, from an implementation standpoint, the, uh, the next step would be to, or another step, is to map out what are all of the summer tasks that students need to be navigating. Um, and it was by building that sort of process map um, that the, all of the, the language, what is the chatbot actually going to say? What is, what is it going to reach out to students about? Um, all of that language was constructed. Um, so, uh, before getting started, we also wanted to specify um, what we hypothesized the outcomes would be in terms of what types of things would be, would be um, what, what types of things would we be moving the needle on. One thing that was particularly exciting for me was that in our, in our previous work, our previous work had been more from the vantage of, say, a high school, where we were reaching out to students over the summer, but students were going to all sorts of different institutions. We could see the end result. Did they enroll uh, where they were expected to enroll? Did they enroll anywhere? But we couldn't look at all of the process pieces in between. By working together with Georgia State University, because they were so facile with their data, we could not only look and see, did students uh, who received this outreach uh, enroll on time uh, at Georgia State University in the fall, um, but did they have greater success with all of those process outcomes along the way? Um, and, so, and so the answer is yes. Students were more successful in navigating um, all sorts of different financial aid related tasks. They were also more successful in navigating uh, more administrative tasks like submitting a high school transcript. Um, and so we were able to really um, test the theory underlying this phenomenon of summer melt. And with the data that, that Georgia State was able to bring to bear to understand that the chatbot, not only were students responding to the chatbot, but indeed the chatbot was helping students to be more successful in all of these required pre-matriculation tasks. So, so it's really a peanut butter meets chocolate kind of experience here that we <laughs> think that we would see more often uh, in, a, 
in a situation in which the researchers and the administrators actually work at the same institution, uh, but we don't. And I, I should actually qualify that and say that very often the institutions that need this help, Georgia, Georgia State is an exception. It is an access-oriented research institution. Uh, but there are plenty of access-oriented institutions that do not have researchers uh, and researchers who do not work at access-oriented institutions. So th there is, I think the, the, there's a lesson here in matchmaking that's really that's important. Right. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say quickly that, you know, while we do have many, many able researchers at Georgia State and we do at times work with them, there is an advantage to uh, using an external scholar in these kind of settings because there's going to be skepticism if Georgia State is reporting its own wonderful innovation and the successes it's having. There's immediately, you know, a question about that. Lindsay was able to cut through the clutter and, you know, get her research in the Harvard Business Review, I think, in a way that probably a Georgia State researcher reporting on Georgia State results wouldn't have been able to do. Yes, as somebody who literally co-wrote the book. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, um, Kelvin's asking a couple of questions that we'll get to in our very last segment of the webinar, which is about what's next. Um, but uh, b before we do that, Scott does ask a question about if this RCT uh, is published anywhere. Um, the, the, the answer is yes. Um, I will, this uh, webinar will be archived as a YouTube video and I will post a link to that study uh, in the blog post that accompanies it. But in the meantime, Lindsay, if you could give everyone the title of that study for their Google Scholar search, that would be a good mm. helpful. Um, gosh, I don't, I, can't, I don't even know the title off the top of my head, but let me tell you everything I know about it. Um, it is published, what is great is it's published, published in an open access journal. So there's no firewall, everybody can you print it and put it in everybody's stocking too. <laughs> um, so it is published in AERA Open. Um, so AERA is the American Educational Research Association, AERA Open. We published it, I believe, in 2018, um, and it is written by myself and my colleague, Hunter Gelbach. So I think if you, um, I'll, I'll find the time to be a, a better uh, representative of my own work. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you typed all of that into Google Scholar, you'd find it. I found it. Um, there we go. Thank no you. Problem on Google Scholar, um, and you are all scholars who know how to use Google, so uh, you should be able to find it. But I promise yeah. I'll I'll post the link. And Michael, Thank let you. me point out quickly because this point hasn't been made yet. That first summer, we reduced summer melt at Georgia State by over ten yeah. percent. Disproportionately, the benefits came to underserved populations. And since then, as we built out the chatbot over the last three years, it's now down by over 33%. So what was 18 to 19% rate of students melting out during the summer is now down to 12%. That translates to about 350 more students every year who are sitting in their seats ready to go when fall classes begin, who a couple years ago were sitting out college entirely. Well, not only does that succinctly uh, answer the, the slide that I believe is, was just up on the screen, uh, but it, it's, it's really the most powerful uh, commercial that I think one can make. We often hear, if you hear anything at all about educational research, it's that it's a world of uncertain multiple causes and small effect sizes. So for someone to be able to report that dramatic a result, that's really uh, deeply significant and important. Now that should cause you to, to, to sit up and take notice. And we should all always be tying uh, our answers back at the end of the day, as Tim did, to number of students who are affected. Uh, it's easy to to uh, get lost in effect sizes and percentages, but at the end of the day, we're talking about humans. Mm -hmm. um, so, given well, such, can a I actually ask Lindsay a question, or please. should you talk uh -oh. about this so eloquently, Lindsay? You mentioned it before. Plan? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the headline of the impact is great, Michael, but actually, I think it's the like uh, unspoken intermediate stuff that astounded me so much, Lindsay, which is the first time you've measured uh, that stuff in the context of students enrolling in college, right? Right, yep. That's, that's exactly right. And, and like I said, from a, um, 
from a research standpoint, the thing that was so exciting for me was that this was really um, the first time that we were uh, more directly testing the theory of what was going on with summer milk. Not that students were just changing their minds or, or something else, I don't know, but it was really that um, by being proactive in reaching out to students, being targeted with data and in, in targeting just the students with the communication that they needed when they needed it, um, we were able to um, improve students' outcomes. And some of the biggest process outcomes that we saw were, were related to all of the financial aid tasks. Um, students were more likely to sign their master promissory note. They were more likely to get timely access to the financial aid that they were eligible for because of this outreach. And, and I think what we realized at that point, Michael, was that what we'd stumbled across was more than a solution to summer melt, mm -hmm. uh, frankly. It was more of a behavior change platform, um, which I know we only have three minutes left uh, Setting us up for the segue to the final segment. Go, go, go. Yeah, it did lead us to want to do some things uh, beyond uh, enrollment, uh, which means we probably have to change the name of the company at some point. Uh, but I'll let other folks talk about uh, what came next. Yeah, so I'll mention quickly that over the last academic year, we've expanded the use of our chatbot with the help of both Drew and Lindsay's research prowess uh, <laughs> for our continuing students, the students who are already enrolled. Their questions don't end on the first day of classes once uh, fall semester began. Uh, and so we've been running another RCT uh, to see what is the impact upon this tool upon our continuing students. And across the board, we've seen really encouraging results there as well, especially in the space that Lindsay was just talking about. In the, in, in the areas of students completing technical tasks like uh, uh, removing holds from their accounts, uh, 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 resolving balances that they owe the university, coming to see advisors in timely fashion. We're seeing in some cases 20 and 30 percent better response rates from the students on the chatbot than from the control group. And Lindsay, do you want to talk a little bit about what questions you want to be asking uh, going forward? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I think that um, the studies that we've done so far have um, been an important uh, sort of proof point on um, the fact that these kinds of tools can be useful. Um, I see the sort of problem of summer melt as a fairly, um, a fairly linear problem. Um, we can really clearly map out the tasks that students need to handle in that summer in order to matriculate on time. And um, uh, as, as Tim and many others in the college success space um, could, could testify, thinking about um, the ways in which we need to better support students to be successful once they've actually matriculated, that's a much bigger and messier problem. So I'm, I'm very excited to be in the space of um, uh, truly testing through RCTs um, uh, where and how these kinds of tools can be uh, useful in um, better supporting students uh, or giving institutions a tool to better support their students um, in order to be successful once they have them. Thank you. Great. So folks, I've promised our panelists uh, that I wouldn't put them on the spot with too, too many specifics uh, because one of the principles about doing research is being humble and you don't want to go forward too soon while you're still learning. You want to tell people what you've learned once you're confident that you've got your ducks in a row. Uh, but uh, the principle behind this webinar series is that um, any um, empirical educator pro uh, project sponsor, which Admit Hub is, can come forward uh, with another demonstration uh, of uh, another contribution of knowledge at any time. Um, and we'll talk about it again. And as you've heard, there's quite a bit of ongoing work. And so you can, you can, um, um, expect to hear more from this crew in the future here and I'm sure elsewhere. Um, and um, just a brief uh, larger programming note, this will go up on, on the web on a YouTube channel. I'll make sure it's known in illiterate. Uh, my dog agrees. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we're going to take a brief um, hiatus for the winter break uh, after this uh, fantastic inaugural session. But we'll have a schedule up soon with some more uh, standard of proof webinars 
coming up uh, in starting in late January. In the meantime, remember, randomized controlled trials, not that hard. Um, <laughs> so thank you all. Thanks to my wonderful panelists. Thanks to your uh, to a fantastic audience. And you all have a wonderful day.